Hello and welcome to The Rest is Football with me, Gary Lineker, Alan Shearer and Micah Richards. It was a potentially pivotal weekend in the Premier League that has ended with things finally poised as we now head into the final 10 games of the season. Micah, you were at Anfield. Um, I trust the atmosphere was um, bouncing <laughs> as normal. Anfield is not normal, honestly. I'm, I, I look at the team sheets first and foremost, and I think mm. City are as strong as can be. Then you look at Liverpool, no Alisson, no Trent, no Canate, and no Salah starting. So you're thinking, City, if they're going to win there, Pep's only won one in nine, I think it is, something like that. They, today's a day. Today's a day they're going to do it. But there's something about the atmosphere, Anfield, that they just don't let you play your normal game. The atmosphere was absolutely outstanding. I thought Kwanzaa for Liverpool was excellent. Keller made a few good saves as well. You got Gomez playing on left back and then right back. It was just, yeah, the atmosphere was, was certainly one of the best. It's a game that you look forward to. Two of the top teams over the last five or six years. I'm not quite sure everyone sort of appreciates how powerful Anfield is, you know. I know. I mean, we've all we've all played there. Um, we've all been there to uh, to watch games. I mean, it is incredibly special. What what they create there is, I think, it's something very different, very unique. It's such a difficult place to uh, to to go and get a result when when the crowd are like they were yesterday. It, I know it, it's an old cliche, but they really are like an, another man there, aren't they? They're just unbelievable. It's weird, isn't it, that that noise <laughs> noise can inspire you. It's odd, isn't it? It's an odd kind of thing that you you play better at home when the crowd are like that. Especially, obviously, you mentioned Anfield is 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 kind of it's not unique, but it's it's very very special. Um, and you just wonder why why it is that. The, the, that force. makes a difference Do a drives force. you on as a player they're energy. definitely a force they're every, everything they bring absolutely the energy is just incredible um, yeah it's a it's a bloody tough place to go and um, I think City will be well there's no doubt about it they were absolutely delighted to walk away yesterday with a point do you ever bang in any goals there Alan? Yeah, Apart from the, you won what you won the, when you won the league, you scored, didn't you? Even though scored there, uh, yeah, scored uh, a couple for Newcastle a few times, yeah. Um, Anfield was one of the first grounds I went to as a kid. You know, I went as a ten or eleven year old. Yeah. My uh, my uncle took me for an FA Cup game, and I thought then, Jesus, this place is incredible. Um, yeah, yeah, they're 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 good fans. They they know what they're talking about. Um, never mind all these. The one question I've got though, and it's 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 for you, Micah, really. Is why was Daniel Sturridge wearing a seatbelt? <laughs> <laughs> he said it himself. He was getting strapped in for the ride, wasn't he? <laughs> Did he? I missed that bit. <laughs> I just saw... what, what are you asking Micah about fashion for? <laughs> <laughs> I would say I'm quite trendy, Alan, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Tommy and Hilminger. To... <laughs> <laughs> it looked ridiculous though didn't it he looked smart he looked he had his little roller neck on a, a lovely black suit then he just got this buckle out of nowhere absolutely <laughs> pathetic <laughs> right to the game itself my goodness me what it, uh, the, the pace of it the, it just went from the first minute to the last minute and I thought Liverpool in the second half were Unbelievably good, <laughs> aside probably from their finishing. Um, so, but they were, I mean, breathtaking at times, wasn't it? Not many times, Michael. Will you see City had the have the run around like like Liverpool gave them in that second half? They were all over the place, weren't they? They were on the ropes, yeah. literally. If Luis Diaz had a little bit more composure, they could have been dead and buried, couldn't they? Yeah. I, I thought um, Ortega did okay when he come on yeah, as well. Did. You see. Did. Edison giving away a penalty. You think, you know, it's not City's day, but he come on, Otega did really well. But Harvey Elliott, what a play he mm. is. He works so hard for the team. You know, when you're watching the game on, on TV, you can always see like people's positions and all that and the cameras panning from one position to the other. But when you're at the game, you see exactly how hard he works. He was composed in possession and then really worked hard for the team. Endo in midfield, wow. 
when he come to Liverpool, I was thinking, okay, good, experienced player. But I didn't think he could get to the levels of that in terms of the intensity of the game. I mean, all the Bundesliga is back and forth, but I thought he was outstanding in the middle of the park yesterday. He really was. The first half was kind of end-to-end, wasn't it? But in the second half, I don't, I don't know what Klopp said to them at half-time, but <laughs> I mean, they were like a different different force, weren't they, Alan? That's exactly what they were. They were they're just, I mean, the energy that they had, and it seemed as if they were... There were every single where every player was seemed to be at it in, on their uh, on the game. Other than the finishing, I mean, he, everything was just incredible up until the most important part. Um, and they, you know what? They may regret that. You know, they may regret not getting those two points because I know they look and think, "Oh, all right, it wasn't a bad result," but <sighs> they should have battered them. They should have they should have scored two or three goals at least. Seriously though, how good is Van Dijk? Oh my goodness. Yeah. He, oh, and I know everyone goes back to the era of John Terry and Rio Ferdinand, So Campbell, Adams, uh, Terry, Cavalier, all these great centre halves. But Van Dijk, he's back to his yeah. best. You know, playing alongside a youngster, Kwanzaa, and then playing with people, another youngster, Bradley, and then Gomez, left back, but marshalling that back line, not having the relationship with the goalkeeper in Allison and playing with Kelleher. I just thought, wow, everything he did, he was up for it, wasn't he? I, yeah. You see that battle between him and Haaland, when Haaland sort of <laughs> yeah. checking one way and going another. He was like, okay, you might get your shot off, but it's not gonna, you're not going to get the angle that you want. He moved his feet really good. Jockey, he's just all round player. Oh, he's 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 unbelievable, really. Is I was thinking yesterday, um, watching the game, actually, that um, if England could steal one player from one other country in the Euros, <laughs> I think yeah. I'd, given where England are in that position, I think I'd go for Van Dijk. Definitely, hundred yeah. percent. We'd love to have him, wouldn't we? It'd be yeah, a pleasure a, to have him. He's a magnificent player. He's a great leader as well, isn't he? He's a great yeah. leader. You can see him all cajoling all of, all the players in and around him and giving instructions. And yeah, he's a fantastic player. Mike is right. Back to his very, very best. He also exudes a calmness, doesn't he? There's never a panic. You never see him roll. You never see him diving in for tackles on his backside. He's pretty much always on his feet, um, and. It, it's that old thing, isn't it, that they say, it's almost a cliche, really, that um, the greats in sport always look like they've got time. Yeah. And I think that definitely applies um, to Virgil van Dijk. Who's better, Rio Ferdinand or van Dijk? I'm throwing it to you guys. Um, well, I would say Virgil van Dijk because Rio's, what, in his 40s now? Is it? <laughs> 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 get, get off that fence, Lee, guys. <laughs> uh, uh, there, there are similarities, aren't there? And they started playing yeah. and everything. Rio had that sort of calmness as well, didn't he? You know, when he, everyone may think it was a, uh, I don't know, a bit of arrogance, but that's that's their their, their style, isn't it? Both of them had that had that yeah. way. It was a real rush of blood from Edison, wasn't it? Ooh, just a bit, yeah. I mean, he was never getting there, was he? It was similar to Man United last week, wasn't it? When he, and he just got it right yeah. with his tackle. Uh, he got the ball and he got the man and I, I, I think it was the right decision. But the interesting thing, when the ball's going back, you know the pass is short. You, why don't he just pull out? He, sh- I, he shouldn't I have don't... gone out. He should have stayed where he, and he's, he, he should, didn't need to go out because it was, it was quite wide from the goal. It wasn't a, an absolute threat, was it? No, it wasn't. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a bad mistake, which, you know, he got injured as well, which is which is not great. But yeah, bad decision. At the wrong time in the game as yeah. well. He doesn't make that many mistakes, does he? So <laughs> He's due one. I have to say I was incredibly impressed with Joe Gomez yesterday, particularly in the second half. I mean, he was playing in all sorts of positions, kind of across the back four. And he was also at times that inverted full back, move, moving inside as well. Um, has he played himself into the England squad? Did you, did you see Klopp's interview after the game? He said something like, not Gareth, are you watching, but... Gareth really like to say any any danger of of picking. What more does he have to do? 
He's put the pressure on. He had a dig at Mike Dean as well. <laughs> he's going out with a bang. I would imagine he's probably not the only person that would have a dig at Mike Dean. Oh. <laughs> what is it with Sky with this like co-commentary referee thing? Yeah, you tell us, Micah. And, uh, yeah, it's it's been he's kind of drifting in. I think um, um, when it was BT, they did they did it a little bit as well. So during the game, I, I don't I don't really understand it. It's like it's almost like saying you pundits don't know the laws of the game. Yeah, but we don't know all the laws of the game, do we? Though, guys, speak for yourself, Micah. I mean, come on, pundits don't know the laws of the game. Well, they the game. should do because it's very much part of the job now. Yeah, but I mean, how many times have you heard pundits get it so wrong? They're just giving their opinion. They're not giving the matter of fact, which name is the names. law. Name names. Name names. <laughs> he's got all quiet look but, but if we can give you insight you can see if it's a foul or not I mean they went on yesterday and it's like blindingly obvious things that it, I, I just don't it's it's just something in me I, I mean obviously broadcasters are always looking to try and change things and do something a little bit different and and all that sort of stuff, but I, I did, I do find that one a, a tad off. You know, I have one. You know, if 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 there's something that's actually contentious at some point, maybe. But I mean, we know what we know a foul. We know when it's. We know the laws of the game. Do, do we though? Do we? Yes. <laughs> I tell you how many times I've read all the rules, laws of the game. <laughs> yeah, but okay. But how many times on match of the day have you had to? Read something new out when they've changed a lot. I can guarantee you every pundit is. Not I think up that's to the it. thing where we, we, you tell the audience about the law of the game, um, so you read out the law of the game um, for them. Um, I don't think we're reading out for them for ourselves, or we shouldn't be. I don't think. <laughs> I understand what you're saying, Micah, but we should know them, shouldn't we? Well, some of us do. I mean, you can tie yourselves in knots with some of the laws because a lot of them are actually kind of, some of them are not actually laws, but there is a guidance, yeah. which that's where it gets confusing. But that, it gets equally as confusing for, for, for everybody that on, on those things because um, because they're not clear, they're ambiguous. So, Did we think it was a penalty? It's one of those, again, that if he'd have given it on the field, he would definitely have given it with VAR. Um, perhaps was it quite strong enough to turn over? I, I don't know. It's another one of those, isn't it, where, you know, the law of the game now and it's everything has to have minutiae detail about whether this and that and the other. And, and, and VAR can make it sound either way. So it, it, it was, I think it was just about maybe a foul. Um, but it takes me to the point, it's like the high bar and the low bar. That bar's gone high again now. We can mm. see that at the moment. Yeah. Lots of decisions were could have been penalties over the weekend that weren't actually given. Um, there'll be a bit of complaint in the next few weeks and then they'll drop the bar again. Um, mm -hmm. um, would you have Gomez in the squad, Micah? England squad? I really uh, enjoyed Gomez before he got injured. He had a bad injury. He, he did. It took a while to get back to his rhythm. Um, obviously, with Matip playing and Kanate playing alongside Van Dijk, the good thing about it, if you if you go into tournament football, if you've got a player who can play in a, a variety of positions, it certainly does help. But it, it doesn't really drop off in the different roles he's chosen to do. And I think we mentioned the other week on the podcast about we're not blessed for centre halves. Would I trust Joe Gomez one hundred percent? I would definitely have him in. Do you see him as a centre half or a fullback? I'd, I'd see him as a, a centre half who can cover for fullback. We, we we look at Luke Shaw. We don't know what's happening with his injury. Chilwell's just coming back from injury. Um, you just when you go to tournament football, as you guys would know, you want people who you can rely on. And I think Gomez, because he can play them different positions, you can rely on him a lot for the. Been a lot better this season. There was, I think, there was there was always a mistake in him, wasn't there? I think it was one of those where you think if I. If he's playing against me, I'm just going to stand with him because he's going to give me something in the 90 minutes. And at the minute, he's 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 cut that out. I think that um, also coincides with the way they play as well, though, Al, because they try play a high line at Liverpool and they try play out from the back as well when at, at every opportunity. 
it can leave you a little bit exposed. Internationals football's a little bit different, as we all know, where you sit a little bit deeper, don't you? You got men in front of you. So I think for for England, it'd be yeah, it it'd be a good choice. Do you think Liverpool have shown the way to play against Manchester City in terms of go for it, be aggressive, be brave? Now, I know you need to have the players to, to be able to do that, but it, it does seem to me that most teams most teams just sit everybody behind the ball and in the end, they'll just wear you down and then they end up winning 2-3-0. Um, Liverpool had a real go. And other teams I've seen this season that probably don't have the, the squads that, that Liverpool have got, um, when they've had a go at Manchester City um, you know you can get at them yeah I think so I mean it, uh, you, you're right but you, you've got to have the ammunition to do that I mean I totally understand why most teams don't because they can't because they've got inferior players um, but when you've got really talented top players particularly in up top like Liverpool have um, then yeah I think without doubt to have a go at them and that's what Liverpool did. That's what other teams that f- will feel as if they're on a par with them or even better than them, and, and they will have a go at them. But you've got to have the players to do it. Yeah. Newcastle will have a go at them next week, Alan. <laughs> it's getting close. Mm. Yeah. FA Cup, Saturday at the Etihad. You said <laughs> Newcastle are winning it, Alan. What are your yes. thoughts now? I'm not changing my mind, Micah. I'm not changing my mind. Pep will change it around as well, won't he? He'll, he'll, yeah. yeah, he will, he will. He changed it around during the game yesterday and mm. one person wasn't very happy, it seems, to yeah. me, Kevin De Bruyne. I don't mind that, though, do you? No, I'd, I don't mind it. I'd, 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 have, I'd have a bigger problem if someone's really happy to come off. Do you know what yeah. I mean? But I, I, that doesn't bother me at all, him not being happy coming off. There was an action before he actually brought him off where... The press didn't go the way it planned and then City give away the ball. And Kevin threw his hands up and Pep was like, ooh. And when you do that to Pep, yeah, I, I think <laughs> he's going to make yeah. a statement by saying, I, I, <laughs> I also I don't don't mind the fact and I actually that Pep actually could see that he got the hump and actually went back into to the bench, didn't he? Have a good chat with him. I, I, think, I think that's, you know, that's, kind of unusual you don't see that because if a, if a player comes up for the hump and they sit on the bench the manager completely ignores them but he came up and had a little chat in his ear I'm not sure I'm, I'm not sure it, KDB was um, um, particularly agreeing with him but nevertheless at least to get an explanation is something isn't it I've never seen that before yeah. Pep normally just leaves them, it? it shows Blanks how them. important Kevin De Bruyne yeah. is to this team doesn't yeah. it I've never seen him do that ever with any player. I mean, there was a couple incidents where Aguero got subbed and Aguero wasn't happy. I didn't see him going over to Aguero. It just shows how important he thinks yeah. Kevin De Bruyne is to this yeah. team. Yeah. Well, he's obviously a leader in the dressing room as well. You want to keep the leaders on board, don't you? Exactly. Well, chaps, we certainly have ourselves a title race, don't we? With um, Arsenal are, are, are flying at the moment. They they struggled a little bit on Saturday. I was doing match of the day, and um, with um, Ian Wright, was very nervous, as you can imagine, in the mm-hmm. um, in the green room when we were watching the games. But it was, um, but I think that you know they're a good side. I I always thought they would probably sneak it um, through, but to, but now, like, what a title race we've got! I mean. I saw some data things or, or not, not, not a bookmaker's service, but one of those things where they evaluate each team's chances going into the rest of the season. And I saw it last week and it said, if there's if Arsenal win against Brentford and City draw with Liverpool, the percentage chances of victory for each three teams will be 34%, 33%, 33%. That I would say is quite even. <laughs> No, it's a great. It's going to be brilliant, isn't it? From now till the end of this, what is it? One point separating the three teams. So yeah. it's, uh, yeah, for for us, uh, for us neutrals, yeah. what a, what a title race it is. It's, it's brilliant. Fantastic. I mean, you have got to give great credit to Arsenal as well. Looked as if it was going to be one of those days, and when it when that happens, you've just got to find a way, haven't you? And they've 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 done that, and they've given themselves a great opportunity as well. Yeah. Kai brilliant Abbott has, has has kind of stepped up, hasn't he? Indeed he has. And I'm glad because obviously it didn't work out for him at Chelsea. 
Although he scored the, the winning goal in the, in the Champions League final against Man City, so he scored big goals before. But I just feel like he's he's really appreciated at Arsenal. And at a time when a lot of people were, were doubting him, what is his position? I think we've all sort of said that, but Arteta's found a way for him to get to his, his best form, the way they play. And he looks like he's he's happy and he's... He's, he's got his confidence back, which is, is nice to see. Eight league wins in a row, Alan. Unbelievable. With loads Brilliant. of goals. Loads, loads and of goals. loads of goals, because I was one of them that said about um, <clears throat> it may affect them with a lack of main centre forward. Well, it hasn't up to now. Um, and you've got to give them great credit for that there. They're playing some brilliant stuff. Um, maybe not so much at the weekend, but before that, they've been been outstanding. And yeah, they've given themselves a fantastic chance. They really have. Um, felt a bit for Aaron Ramsdale in Ooh. half time, didn't you? I mean, oh, dear, dear. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I think oh. that, oh, I bet if the ground could have opened up for him then. I, I mean, he's got this Ooh. slightly strange habit when he goes to clear the ball, particularly when he wants to hit it long, where he, he kind of needs to take a little slight step back every time. You know, like little kids do when they go to kick the... I'm exaggerating, but when little kids first start to kick the ball, they don't just kick it. They have to go a few paces back first and then kick it. And he, he has a tendency uh, to do that a little bit. So I'm sure he'll learn from, from that mistake. And he made a couple of great saves in the second half. What a goal that would have been from Tony if it... Oh, what a strike, wasn't it? Oh, what? Incredible. Difficult ball volley. to hit, yeah. Oh, just a bit. Yeah, yeah, you've got to give him great credit, you know, because the pressure he would have been under with that mistake and then thinking, oh, no. I mean, I, I did, I felt sorry for him, but you've got to give him great credit for the way, he, yeah, he it didn't let it affect him and he made some really important saves. That's why you don't have two number ones, though. Or it was told to us that it, they was going to rotate. When Rea came in, he's basically number one. And now you've got someone on the bench who knows he's under massive scrutiny. And you know what it would have been like before that game, sleeping, the going for the league. Don't make a mistake. Don't make yeah. a mistake. And then he makes a mistake. But I agree with Alan. He covered so well. I was delighted for him. I, I really was because yeah. it was that added pressure for, for 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 no reason. Yeah, it's it's funny, isn't it? How that pressure is applied to 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 Ramsdale with this current situation. I suppose it's quite unusual with goalkeepers, but. Because normally, if a, if a keeper gets injured, like Keller, for, Keller, for example, for, for Liverpool, he's coming, he's, he's done brilliantly. But no one's thinking, oh, blimey, I hope he, I hope he doesn't make a mistake in this one. And, you know, Ramsdale, who'd had, yeah, by and large, a pretty damn good season yeah. uh, last year. It's, it's strange that that pressure and, and everybody's eyeballs seem to be on him when, he's, when he was in goal because of, I guess, because it was a surprising decision by Arteta, I think, to, to bring in another goalkeeper. Well, I think because of the, I think everyone accepts, I mean, you mentioned Keller, I think everyone ex accepts that um, he's number two at Liverpool and when Alisson's fit, he'll he'll play. Um, I mean, we know the situation at Arsenal now with Arteta, who he wants and who he prefers, but he has got two number ones there, hasn't he? And that, that, that's the reason why there's so much, that we're all looking at that because he, he himself, Ramsdale, is a number one. It's funny though, if you've got, you know, nowadays with say you've got two number nines and no, no one would think anything about that I mean you know Sir Alex Ferguson notoriously always had four kind of strikers didn't he and, and, and rotated them quite a bit nobody thinks a thing but when it happens to a goalkeeper um, I remember when um, was it Jim Greenwood the England manager way back when he wrote he rotated Ray Clements and Peter Shilton um, that's before you were born, Micah. But um, <laughs> and he was doing it game by game, and everyone thought that was a bit, bit weird. So it's always been a case with goalkeepers; it's a little bit different. How important do you think it is that that both Liverpool and Manchester City have won the league in in recent years, and, and Arsenal haven't? Do you think that counts against Arsenal at all? Slightly, I do. Yeah. Um, the quest is I'm not as if they haven't won it before. They have won it, but the, yeah. that's why Teta, Arteta's there. They, they were there so much last season and it didn't happen. They spent a few quid again in the summer. Um, so, yeah, I think there's there's more, there's more there would be more pressure on uh, Arteta than there is on the other two because they've been there and um, Liverpool and City have done it. 
I, I think we, we mentioned the running, don't you? And if you're Arsenal, basically, it's go to, to Man City and, and don't lose. Do you remember last season where I was thinking, OK, this is D-Day, Arsenal need to get a result. And Man City wiped the floor with them. So now it's about, OK, how much have we improved from last season? What can we take from last season that we could bring into this season and recover from that and go again? That is going to be you know, the games or end of the month, isn't it? Is it time finally for The Apprentice to beat his sorcerer? Ooh, I mean, going to the Etihad, you know, and Pep said it in his interview after the game yesterday, everyone talks about the record at Anfield. He said Klopp's not won in the league at Man City for eight years, which yeah. was a really good point, wasn't it? You know, so going to the Etihad is not an easy place to go. Hmm. They would snap your hands off for a point, no doubt about it. Oh yeah, for sure. Definitely. Have you had a look at the run-ins of the three clubs? I've got all the fixtures um, written down here in front of me. Um, I won't bore you by reading every single one out. Um, but... Aston Villa and Tottenham Hotspur will play a big part in the title race because all three sides play both Spurs and Villa. Um, Man City have got um, Villa at home and Spurs away. Liverpool have got Spurs at home and Villa away. And um, Arsenal have got uh, Villa at home and Spurs away as well. Um, Arsenal also have Manchester United away, as do Liverpool. Um, so there's some big games in there. I, I think aside from that, they're very similar in terms of the level of play. In fact, the run-ins are remarkably similar. <laughs> so Brilliant. I really do think mo most of, I think the games will be won by all three sides all the way. And can you imagine if on the last day of the season, the, you kind of got three teams, all kind of <laughs> level points. Um, at present, obviously, Arsenal have got the best goal difference as well, which that speaks a lot as well. You know, you know when you're looking at teams like Manchester City and, um, and and Liverpool and Arsenal have got a better goal difference, um, you know, mainly because what they've done since the turn of the year, um, when they've banged in so many goals and conceded very few. It's going to be interesting because don't forget there's, there's Champions League football as well. Uh, there's, there's FA Cup also as well obviously um liverpool are in europa so what happens if arsenal beat porto and then get man city in in the quarters is that Ooh. gonna have an effect there's there's so many variables it's it's so hard to say but i i, I still think city are not at their very best and if that does click that you know that they're a point behind and they've not clicked yet. They've not been at the best. So if they get to the best, I still think City just have that Oh, you do advantage. surprise me. <laughs> 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 well said, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but you, you said Arsenal, Gary. I mean, I, I, they had a little bit of a wobble. Yes, but they? I stuck by them even when they had their wobble, Mike. You stuck by them. Yeah, no. I mean, it, it pains me a fraction, obviously, as a, as a, a former Tottenham man. Um, but um, but they were they were terrific. In a game they really really had to win. You felt if they want to have a chance of being fourth, um, they did so. And now they've put themselves in prime position for that. Um, but boy, oh boy, they were good in the second half, weren't they? Well, they were electric. They were. Yeah. I mean, they were unbelievable and punched them. I thought that, again, I thought that was a really good... I mean, the first half, I thought both teams um, went at each other. The energy from both of them was uh, was superb. But um, but Tottenham just blew them away in the second half, didn't they? They were incredible. Mm. They, they were terrific, played some great football. I thought Madison ran the show again. Um, he's turned himself into... Well, he is a great footballer, but he's, he's, he's also a leader... Um, on the field, you can see him cajoling the players all around the place. Um, the recruitment's been so good, they've made themselves a really competitive side now. Do you think, Micah? Yeah, they really have. Um, I, it was sad to see Van der Ven go off the pitch, though. Mm. I mean, when you talk about tactics and how they want to play, we've given Ange Postacoglu. <laughs> so well funny. said. <laughs> so much credit, haven't we? And yeah. they play so high. And it was Danny Murphy who was doing match of the day 
to yesterday and he did a really good um, piece on how brave the, the centre-backs were and what it was good, the, the, the push really high up, the sort of go man for man at the back against Bailey and, and Watkins. But what that does lead into a race constantly. So Villa tried to get the ball quickly forward and then van der Ven's constantly having to sprint back he's got big numbers one of the the fastest players yeah. in the premier league but then now he's he's going to be out if he's tweaked his his yeah. hamstring again so they play great football front-footed football entertaining stuff that we all want to see but for the center halves it is it is hard it is hard yeah. work really hard work they're one of the sides you want to watch though now, aren't they? And that's an important part of football, the entertainment factor. Um, you know, when when they're on telly, you think, oh, yeah, a bit of Tottenham, this, this, will, be, this will be exciting. Yeah, the manager's done well, hasn't he? He's got that yeah. style of play um, and it is risky um, with what they do with their uh, full-backs. And you've got to have a quick centre-half if you're going to play that way. And certainly Van der Ven is, uh, there's, there's, there's no one run quicker than him I don't think but um, you've got to give him great credit for the way he sort of came in his players understood pretty quickly what he was trying to do and um, and it's worked for them and they, they are a really good team to watch good energy um, and they've got something about them you know the, the, the strange thing you know when we talk about top players and we always give Son his, his credit but you know when people are sort of linked with teams son never really seems to get linked with a barcelona or a real madrid or because he's playing for one but they're a massive club <laughs> spurs they're a massive club but i mean he is he's world class yeah. literally oh he's brilliant my god he? he's yeah. unbelievable like his work rate his technique he's running in behind he's finishing he's got absolutely everything I tell you, I tell you what else he's got. He's got a little bit of attitude, you know. Yes. And because he, you always think the, the, the interviews after the game, and he always plays with a smile on his face, <laughs> and he's really nice, guy. nice and polite. But you can see when he doesn't get the ball, when he thinks he should be getting it, he, he absolutely dishes out Brilliant. a bollocking. Yeah, yeah I does. love it. I think he's an amazing player. He's got. I mean, he's a dream for your team, isn't he? Because his attitude is just incredible. And Mike has said about his abilities. Just yeah, you can understand why everyone loves him particularly the Spurs fans. Yeah. You talked about Van der Ven there, Micah. Um, get a centre-half perspective, but I thought the new signing, Dragerson, when he came on, I thought he did really well, you know. Yeah, they, they paid about £27 million for him, um, I, I, I believe. Genoa, wasn't it? Yes, it was about around that 27 mark anyway. And sometimes it's, it's, it's difficult coming into a system where you have to be exposed to, to the high line. I think the old-school defenders... We, we like to sit deep, people in front of us and sort of communicate from the back and you would defend your box, as it were. That was when you would come into play. But they've got to do so much more now, whether it's on the ball, building up, having a high line, being able to, to run back in position, also while having to track runners and defend your box. So I thought he had a really good game. He could play a little bit midfield as well, so... Yeah, really good addition for them. There was, there was quite an amusing moment towards the latter stages of the match where he, he, he let's say, he took one in the um, in the bollocks. <laughs> 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 a ball got blasted at him from about five yards away and he went down. But the, what was, I mean, it, there's always something amusing about that. I don't know why, because it's it, it's definitely not amusing when it happens to you. Well, it but, depends on the size, doesn't it? I mean, <laughs> some, some are well-blessed. Yeah, what, some those, are, what, the, what, those meter balls or the Nike balls? It depends how big they are. Is that what you're saying? So... Um, so there was a there was a brilliant moment where he went down and he's he's clutching on and then they just obviously inside the ground they played a replay on the on the big screen and you could hear there were about sixty odd thousand fans all went ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I remember I played at um at the city ground at Forest um in a game again um for Spurs and. I was in the. I was always brought back. It's the only time I ever came back was if there was a free kick, and I was in the wall. And Stuart Pearce was was taking the free kick, and he, you know, he, he had a thunderous shot. Did um, did Stuart, and I, he 
kind of did a long run up and he blasted it, it hit me str oh, straight in there. I was like, I went, <laughs> oh my God. And and it was the one time I, I think I can ever remember Stuart Pearce laughing because he's so <laughs> serious. <laughs> Who's going to finish fourth? Spurs or Villa? It's, it's, it's almost as difficult as the league probably, but Spurs have the momentum at the moment. Yeah. Spurs, I would say, yeah. Spurs Just. have got a game in hand, haven't they? Mm, yeah, which is slightly in their favour. Let's just hope it's top five so we get Villa and Spurs in the Champions League, okay? I think I think there's every chance of that. Your mate John McGinn had a moment of madness. Oh! Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's one of those, right? We're so, we, you know what it's like when you're doing the broadcasting and he, you know when there's, there's four of us in the studio, me... Jimmy Carragher, Roy Keane, Daniel Sturridge. And some, if you're a striker, you might get the offensive stuff. Defender, you might get the, the defensive stuff. And two people had already gone. And he said, and, and John McGinn here, Mike. And I'm like, oh, John McGinn's my mate. I don't want to put him away. <laughs> I could tell I was, I was like, Yeah, he's a, he's a good lad. He's not that way. Yeah, but I, I saw you. Yeah, he's not, he's <laughs> thinking he's going to the <laughs> Moonwalking out of that one. <laughs> Reverse. Oh, that is, that is the worst part about the, the punditry. Obviously, we've got to be... Uh, honest about the situation, but when it's your mate, you're like, oh, come on, give it to someone else. Oh, yeah, <laughs> give that question to someone else. You'll, you'll find, Mike, as you, as you get older, you'll have fewer and fewer mates that are actually playing anymore. <laughs> yeah. You won't give a monkey. Uh, <laughs> Speaking it, of mates, has Mourinho texted you back yet? Or he's still not your mate? <laughs> oh, he did text. He did text you back. Oh, yeah. okay. He did. He sent, he sent a hug. He said hugs. You know. Well, tell him to get his fucking ass on here then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was that friendly. <laughs> <laughs> Ask him, ask him, guys. Yeah, come on, buddy. Yeah, maybe, possibly. Uh, elsewhere in the um, Premier League, um, some interesting games down down the bottom. Poor old Burnley can't win a game, can they? Two nil up at Two half time, up. and oh, no. last minute equaliser from 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 Danny Danny Ings. I knew that uh, if West Ham were to get one, then they'd the, be under huge pressure, Burnley, and. Um... Yeah, Danny Ings of all people. <laughs> oh, come on, yeah. There's a little bit of sympathy, but for Burnley now, Al. Come on, they got you two goals, eh? And yeah. it's just, <laughs> just, just my, what? get it over the line. It's it's my fun, partner at Goalhanger, as we've mentioned once or twice, is is a Burnley fan. And in our group chat yesterday, didn't he? At half time, he went, "Let's see how we can blow this one." <laughs> 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 he, he saw it coming. Yeah. I think. I think um, it, it does that to your football, doesn't it? At times where you just know that it's going to go against your side, yeah, time and time again. Luton got a valuable point at, at Crystal Palace. I thought actually Crystal Palace were pretty dominant in that game and, and, and missed a few chances. Eze was superb again. I mean, what he had, an, he had an effort from the halfway line as well, didn't he? Oh, oh, just he was inside, so close. unbelievable. He just thing. flicked the top of the crossbar, oh, didn't it? Yeah, we are, I know we've said it before, but. Um, those those three at the bottom, because of what could happen to Everton and to Nottingham Forest, then it's really important that they do pick up the odd points here here and there. You know, they've conceded two late goals with with Glasner, um, but that doesn't mean anything yet. But they, you know, they I thought Palace played pretty well. Um, it's it's really difficult to know what's going to happen at the bottom, isn't it? With all that stuff, with possible more deductions and, and, and stuff. So I suppose, do you think that's probably difficult for the teams that are not under threat of those of those points to actually focus properly? I suppose you've just got to get on with your own games. Aren't you? There's nothing you can do about that. But it was interesting when we had Tom Lockyer on and um, and if if you didn't hear that um, interview, um, everybody, I think I think you'll really enjoy it. I, th I thought he was... Um, he was very open and frank, um, not just about um, what happened to him on the field, uh, which was very moving, I thought, but also, um, also, you know, where Luton are and how Luton are doing and stuff like that. He's he's really impressive, wasn't he? And also, guys, he, he did say from a player's perspective in the dressing room that they are they are thinking um, what could happen yeah. to the other two clubs as well. So it is being spoken about. Yeah, yeah, but of course we all know that, don't we? The, 
you know, yeah. I saw James Madison interviewed after the game yesterday, and um, I think the comment he asked him about what, what do you think the chances are top, f-? and he went, "Oh, I'm sorry about the cliche, but you know, we only you only ever focus on <laughs> the next game, and you know, players are programmed to say that because you'd be stupid not to. But we all know we all think about what this could do or that could. They'll be having the conversations we are now about if they beat that, you know, if they beat them <laughs> like yeah, we do. Exactly. So yeah. it's, I think that's kind of normal for that sort of thing. We actually did a social media poll um, on our uh, a feed after the Tom Lockyer episode um, about whether Luton would stay up. 75% said they thought Luton would stay in the Premier League. I wonder if they're thinking because of but what's going to happen to the others? Or they genuinely think they'll have enough points to get more than anything yeah. else. I would yeah. imagine a bit of both because yeah. there's still a few points adrift, aren't they, at present? Forest are struggling to win a game, aren't they? Yeah, it, they, you'd be really worried if you're a Forest fan about what's what's going on there. Um, the uncertainty, performances, confidence uh, is, is low. <clears throat> It's a worrying time for them. Actually, it's the two teams, isn't it, with the threat of points deductions yeah. um, that are struggling at the moment. I mean, I know Everton rallied just after the initial charge, didn't they? But the, they've not won in about nine games now either. I thought that Everton did really well on at the weekend, but they just couldn't score again. I mean, the chances they created um, and then getting into so many dangerous positions, but... Scoring goals for Everton has been a problem for a while. Where have you been this weekend? I've not seen you on uh, across my TV. Is it a weekend off for you? Or? Just been watching loads and loads of football, Micah. Really? Doing yeah. his homework, you see. On just the waters, to, or are you having just, a few bevies, or no? I went to uh, I went to the pub yesterday afternoon with, a, with um, and had a couple of pints, and um, turned around when you came on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're stealing all my top analysis, aren't you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Watching the game in the pub, eh? Watching the game oh, in the great. pub. Oh, great. He loves it, doesn't he? He's in the local pub. Everyone, Alan Shearer, this, Alan Shearer, that. Oh, <laughs> you can't get <laughs> over it. I might be in the local pub tonight as well, watching Chelsea Newcastle. Did they all sing the song when you're in the pub, Al? <laughs> <laughs> what are you on about? He's orchestrating it. <laughs> uh, oh, Big Ian Wright is doing Monday night football tonight, isn't he? Is, he is, he is, yeah. on Sky. Yeah. On Sky? Uh, yeah. Right. I, I spoke to him about it on, on Saturday, he said he was doing it. I went, oh, are oh, you? Yeah, interesting. He said, yeah. He said, I promised Cara ages ago, and I thought, I'd, I, you know, blah, blah, blah. He'll be, he'll be class, won't he? He always is, he always is. Um, before we go... Have you seen how horribly tight it's getting in the championship as well? Oh, three points in it. <laughs> oh, God. Problems. Uh, What's God. happening, guys? What's happening? Uh, I don't know. I mean, Leicester have got obviously that th- thing hanging over them as well for um, points deduction, which if they do go up, they could get right at the start of next season, which is, you know, start with minus six or something. That would be bloody depressing. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I, you know, the, the rules are the rules, and if if you break them, you, you know, it's may, may or may not be my team, but that's you know, you, I, I would criticise the, the the management of the of the club at that point. But anyway, um, if that's um, if that is indeed the case, but yeah, I only won one of the last five, Leicester. Squeaky, 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 squeaky bum time. Yeah, an interesting. Why is it in football? Nothing's ever bloody easy, is it? There you were, cruising <laughs> along, 10 points, 11 points clear. It was, hey, come on, it was more than that. I'm sure it was up to 15 at one point. Oh, I'm not sure. It, was, it might have been 15 from the um, third spot, but it was certainly, yeah. But it's, yeah, they had a big lead. Um, but it's, I suppose every team's going to have a sticky spell, as long as it doesn't last any bloody longer. Marching all together. Oh, here he goes. We want to see you win. No, uh, no, 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 no. We are so proud. We'll shout it out loud. We love you. Leeds. 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 <laughs> We're marching on. Oh, God. Oh, God. Fucking hell, you're not an ambassador for them as well, are you? Hey, I'm I mean, born and bred in Leeds. Chapel Town. Yeah. Chapel Town. Chapel Town. Born and bred in Leeds as an Arsenal fan. Yeah, we know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Leicester 82 points. Leeds 79. Ipswich 78. Um, Southampton not too far behind that as well. 
Um, I mean, Ipswich had a bit of a shocker as well. I think they were they were winning with. I think they scored two goals in injury time, like ninety four and one hundred minutes or something. Um, so is it? And have you seen it at the other end of the table by any chance in the championship? Mad as well, isn't it's it? It's unbelievable. Yeah, there's yeah. seven teams from like just two points separated from seventeenth to to twenty third. Now that is pressure. It's a bigger pressure on a team getting out of the championship to the Premier League, or more pressure staying in the championship from going to League One. I would think staying in there, no? Do you? I mean, yeah, yeah but you know, getting into the Premier League, surely, you know, yeah, but if you, you're going to rele- you get relegated next season anyway, back down to the Championship. Fuck off. <laughs> 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 oh dear we'll have a moment of the week um, Harry Kane Ooh. three more goals two in midweek in the, in the Champions League I mean whatever happens and even if Bayern Munich do, don't win a trophy this season that I'm sure they will next year um, what what a season he's having I mean we all knew he would though didn't we we all knew the quality he possesses yeah, yeah but it's, it's it's you know it's not necessarily an easy thing packing your bags and going abroad different culture different way of life different football club he's been at Tottenham obviously for a hell of a long time um, you know you've still got to go out and do it and he's boy has he done it uh, four sensational hat- four hat-tricks now this season he's broke all sorts of records hasn't oh. he I mean off the charts isn't he he's yeah. just been absolutely sensational and now we'll move on to our questions um, one for you, Alan, really, for a start, from mm-hmm. Liam Stevenson. Being a lifelong Newcastle fan, I'm torn by the prospect of the rumours the owners are looking to build a new stadium. The history of St James's Park versus a new 70, 80,000 seater stadium. Keen to hear Alan's thoughts on this. Oh, um, I think one of the best things about St James's Park is, is, is its position that it's so close to the city centre. Um, so whether they were going to extend it, fine. But if they were going to build a new one, I think it has to be pretty much next door or really close because I think that's why we generate such a great atmosphere. It, it's so, so iconic and it's in the city centre. So if it is going to be a new stadium, then it has to be pretty much next door to where it is yeah, or certainly not far away should they or should they not get rid of the slope <laughs> <laughs> um i would have said yes when i was fucking backpedaling <laughs> up when i was trying to chase back when i was playing um but it is <laughs> it is a, it is a um the hell of a slope there at st james's park isn't it yeah what do you think micah Yes, get rid of that slope. Ridiculous. <laughs> it's slope. funny as football fans, though. I think when when it comes when the news comes that they you're going to get a new stadium, you always think, "Oh no, I love this place." And it's like with Filbert Street, which was a very tired, small old ground. Everyone's, "Oh, we're leaving Filbert Street," and then you end up in this nice stadium. Once you get used to it, you go, "Oh, this is so much better." You know, it's happened obviously with Arsenal and Tottenham and. And Manchester City, a prime example, going from Main Road um, to obviously the where they had the Commonwealth Games in, in Manchester. Can't you uh, just, I don't know, refurbish it, Al? Yeah, take I think out I, the yeah, old and possibly, yeah. New? But I do think I do think that the proximity is really, really important with it being in the town, yeah. in the right there, and I think that that helps generate a great atmosphere. So if it is going to be moved, then it has to be pr- really, really close to where it is. But I don't see... Yeah, I mean, uh, that's the other option as well, yeah. Mike. They do to, get tired, though, these, these old grounds, don't yeah. they? And, and you take Old Trafford, for example. I remember when I played, I thought, yeah. oh, what a place to play football. Now you go there and it's kind of... It's not that impressive anymore, is it, in terms of an actual stadium? I think even Jim Radcliffe, when he came in, didn't he, said one of the things that that needs to happen here is, is that a club like Manchester United should have a, you know, we've, you've, we've seen it happen at big clubs like the um, Real Madrid. They've just recently done the Bernabeu. Um, Barcelona are now currently doing the, the, the camp now. There's some amazing stadiums uh, across Europe. Uh, anyway, we move on um, to Steve Ethorn. Um, probably one for you this, Micah. Uh, why do you think so many teams are having so many injury problems? 
Is it the extra length of games or has training changed? As a Leeds fan, hoping it's Leeds and Leicester for a quick return to the Premier League, although it's a lot more fun winning and a lot more games. Um, yeah, so he had two points there. And um, I'll agree with him, Leicester and, and Leeds. Sorry, Ipswich fans. I'll agree if it was Leicester and Ipswich as well, or Leicester and Southampton or Leicester and anyone. But um, <laughs> um, but in terms of, it is an issue. We do seem to be getting a lot of injuries. I think we've kind of, talked about this a little bit before but um i i you know we've always played a lot of football um so whether it's that or not i don't know um with with medical technology now and stuff they can assess players better so they perhaps can work out when you're going to get injured a little bit um but i always wonder whether it might be because the playing surfaces now aren't they because they're all a mixture of grass and kind of synthetic stuff aren't they so I wonder whether that firmness of the ground and the, the fact that you can sprint properly, because when I played, it's very it's quite hard to pull a hamstring when you're running through mud. Um, so you don't go quickly enough to, to do it. So <laughs> I wonder whether that's got anything to do with it. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I, and I don't want to seem like, oh, back in your day, the, the game was a lot slower, but the intensity is a lot. Hard no, now. It's not. It's, it's not. It's. It wasn't slow. The, the 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 input that. So I think when I was around, when I was around eighteen, nineteen, the the top sprinter, which was normally or or distance covered, would be James Milner. Would be around twelve k, eleven k, but now they're getting up to thirteen k. But with higher intensity as well. So if you do that, you, you're going to get more injuries coincided with the amount of games you have to play. But the only argument against it, the squads are a lot bigger now. So you should be able to utilize your squad a little bit better. So I think there's arguments for both, but I, I definitely think the game has got a lot quicker, in my opinion. No, I, I would... I would chuck something at you and I don't know what not but you've got um, games are a lot longer now you're playing for 10 or 15 minutes almost every game and what is happening more now is is the stop start for players players are hanging around more in a game i.e. waiting for a decision um, I don't know substitutes there's more now than there's ever been so when you when you put all that together, maybe that's one of the reasons. I don't know. I'm just chucking it out there. Yeah, we're not scientists, but who knows? Um, Prabhu Weerasinghe um, asks: Out of the retired football pundits, who would be the fittest? Um, I presume he means in terms of actual fitness rather than the way they look. Uh, <laughs> my <laughs> my vote, he says, would go to Clarence Seedorf, but I think um, Thierry Henry will give it a good go. Oh, yeah. Well, well, well should we start with BBC first? I mean, Well, it ain't going to be me. I'm 63, but I'm not a pundit either, so... <laughs> yo, yo, well, we'll just go broadcasters. Let's start with, 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 with BBC. Guys, you're in very good shape for your age, aren't you? And, and there's no shade meant by that. What do you that. mean for my age? Can't you just say you are in very good shape? <laughs> <laughs> it means you're an old fucker. I don't know what he means. Jermaine Jenner's <laughs> is, is, is aging quite well, isn't he? He's in the gym all the time. You're going to bring this round to yourself in the end. I know you are, Mike. He's, get, he's <laughs> getting there, isn't he? Oh, he wants us to see it. Mike, you spend a bit of time in the I, gym. Alan, you're... How old are you? 53? Three? You're looking very good for a 53-year-old. Um, I've seen you in the gym, though. You're more of a, a jogger on. I've seen you on the treadmill. Could no, go a little bit that. quicker, but yeah. <laughs> oh, Daddy no. Murphy nah. is, is, is miles off the pace. <laughs> <laughs> Who else we got? Ashley Williams is a good nick, but he's, he's younger. But he's very recently retired. It's going to favour the more recently retired, this one, isn't it? Obviously, Of course, he got big beaks. Wow. You live in the gym, don't you? Specimen. What about, what about the Sky Mob? Who's, who's fittest, Neville or Carragher? Or ne or... <laughs> I wouldn't say Neville. <laughs> Roy Keane. Is Roy Keane looks in or decent shape? Oh, or Roy Keane's in, in, in good nick. But I think he's more dog walking. He takes his dogs out, doesn't he, every, every day. I don't think he goes to the gym that much. Um, so do I, but he's still getting the gym a bit. Cara, Cara's good with the boxing. Yeah. Uh, but Thierry Henry, I did a session with Thierry Henry 
in Vegas, and I thought I was fit. We was doing what, what a gym session. Was this was this before <laughs> or after your night out? <laughs> before I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Jarring. <laughs> no, I'm, joking. I'm, just, I'm just joking. It's a joke. It's a joke, people. It's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. But I'd say no. I'd say Thierry Henry. Different level. Okay. Different level. Of okay. Fitness. Um, William Gibson. This is quite a long one, but I, I think it's quite interesting. Hi, Gary, Alan, and Mike are loving the podcast. Uh, thank you. As someone who is short-sighted and therefore needs to wear contact lenses to play football, I have always wondered how many professional footballers also have poor eyesight, noting that both Gary and Mike are often wear their glasses on screen. Did either of you struggle to see on the pitch to the extent <laughs> that you needed to wear contact lenses to play, or did any of your former teammates uh, spend a couple of minutes before every game putting contact lenses in? If so... Did they ever fall out during the game, leaving them helplessly wandering around the pitch, unable to see? My <laughs> eyesight was was always um, pretty good until um, until I got older and needed them for reading. And and Al, Alan Alan's getting that, that there now. Yeah. I've seen him <laughs> whack on the glasses occasionally for reading. Micah, you're you're right. Did you wear contacts? Didn't you? to play no didn't. I didn't wear contacts I needed to wear contacts oh. it explains a lot <laughs> <laughs> I'm not exaggerating I swear I could only see the ball when it was about five or ten yards in front of Joking. me I just had to sort of <laughs> guess what? I, I, I'm honest honestly no I'm not you exaggerating. so many fucking mistakes <laughs> Mikey you could have been like the greatest defender of all time if you could see I, I know <laughs> What a, what a physio said to me, fucking hell, if you could actually see, you'd be fucking the next fucking Beckham. Why do you get contacts? <laughs> I couldn't wear them, they used to hurt my oh, eyes. bless you. I know, so yeah, I could only see the ball five or ten yards. So I used to just anticipate where the ball's going to be. I used to take my position of where the striker was going to be rather than where the ball is. Guys, you know that story I tell about uh, Chris Nickel in the Southampton dressing room? When he, he we, we had an absolute shocker and he comes at the end of the game and he goes around the whole dressing room, shit, shit, shit. And he gets to Tim Flowers, our goalkeeper. He says, get your fucking eyes tested. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me, actually, that that reminds me of um, a player that I did play with, which always used to worry me before. The, he was, I always used to see him, he goes in the bathroom and then he's putting his contact lenses in the game. He was the Eric Torsved, Tottenham's goalkeeper. Goalkeeper. And I used to think, oh God, it always worried me, but he put contact lenses in to see. Um, but it, it worked. He was a very good goalkeeper, actually. Uh, and on that note, let's take a little break. Yeah. Um, Anthony Fernandez asks, were there any players you played with that weren't necessarily the biggest, but were exceptional headers of the ball? I'd say me. <laughs> <laughs> he mentions Diogo Jota which Speedo is had the best leap absolutely did he? yeah, yeah. Oh. I mean he was I don't know what he was was he maybe six foot just under I guess guys um, but he had his leap and his timing was unbelievable Cristiano Ronaldo could leap couldn't he cool blimey still can yeah I would say Wayne Rooney for, for a little lad what is he 5'9 five, 5'10 five, he could leap when he, when he got up there he could leap I'd go Wazza on that one. It's all about timing. Yeah, have you seen Ossiman? I mean, I know he's big anyway, but boy, he could spring. He can mm. spring, yeah. Simon Simmons, um, probably more of a question for Gary. Uh, but my dad is of similar age to you and loves football. However, he always says that he doesn't understand when people talk about formations nowadays. Was there ever talk about for formations when you were playing? Uh, or is the current obsession with playing systems more of a modern phenomenon? Well, I think Alan also, if you don't mind, Simon, um, is not that far <laughs> behind the age-wise. I think there's always been formations in football, hasn't there? Even yeah. way before even I played. You know, you used to talk about the, we mentioned it on here before, about the WM formation. Um, then, mm. you know, it was mostly, I think, 4-4-2 four, four, in, in my time. Most teams played that way. But around the world, I played against lots of different kinds of football, whether, you know, sweepers, three at the back, um, one up front, one just behind, all sorts of... Dip. It's always been the case, hasn't it, Alan? Yep. 
Terry Venables did it. What the Christmas tree thing that was Euro '96. Um, so yeah, systems of yeah, yeah. I think what been we around what forever. we do have now, of course, is there's just much more discourse, much more discussion on on football tactics, probably on television, yeah. radio, podcast, etc. So, so whereas back in our day, you'd, you'd read a little bit in a newspaper where they probably wouldn't talk too much about the tactical formations and stuff and and there wasn't that much punditry on television um ian smith looking at the season kai havertz is now having and him popping up with another big goal at the weekend how do players turn it around is it all down to the player or is it the manager that sparks the change speaking about kai havertz what about his dive oh yes we didn't talk about that at the weekend, did we? Well, it was a dive. That's why it? we brought it up. It was definitely a dive. Yeah, a dive yeah. He'd already had a yellow card. Of course, if yeah, that is a yellow card offence diving, but I don't think the Very referee lucky. could see it. And VAR obviously can't intervene if it's just a yellow card decision. Yeah, he got a weird He one. did. He did. And then scored the definitely. winning goal, of course. Um, but what do we think? How do you turn it around if it's not going well? Manager, isn't it? I think it's firstly, it's your manager. Uh, who who believes in you, gives you the, we mentioned that word trust a lot, don't we? And then it just comes with, from within. It should always come first, do the best and train hard and try to improve your game. But if you don't have the trust from your manager, you're never going to get to the levels that you, you want to. So it's a bit of both, but when you've got a manager who believes in you, it makes such a difference. Yep, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't disagree with that. El mm. Scotto asks... Uh, for Micah, imagine playing against Ooh. a strike partnership of Lineker and Shearer. What would your game plan be and how do you think you would cope? <laughs> a helpful tip maybe, but my suggestion will to go to an old school and snap them early and show them who's <laughs> boss. I beg your pardon, snappers? <laughs> he, he wouldn't get close enough. Micah couldn't cope with us, well, guys. Well, hold on, hold on. I had a couple of minutes against Al and he did nothing. Didn't he squat? <laughs> he didn't come near me. <laughs> Did he get uh, subbed off in that game as well? Something uh, like that. Honestly, I wish I'd have played against you a bit longer. I'm, oh, oh, I would have battered you. I would have taken you every blade of grass on the pitch and ran you fucking ragged. <laughs> right, Micah. This leads me on to a next question. and I'd like you to remember when you answer what Alan has just said about you. Okay? Okay. Mike Merton. Big Meeks. Sell, buy and bench. Harry Kane, Alan Shearer, Gary Lineker. Oh, 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 come on, Meeks, come on. Buy, <laughs> sell, bench. Oh, what a great question that is. Sell, buy, bench. Ooh. Mr. Creosote is going to have to get over <laughs> He's thinking about his answer. Any danger, Micah? Get, get some creosote, will you? Know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Canella podcast is only going to be about 40 minutes. You've been thinking five. This is, this is the longest VAR in history. They'll edit it up. Don't worry. Ancient John, don't worry. Just, just give me a couple of seconds, will you? Sell... <laughs> All right, all right. Cause I never, cause I never seen Gaz play. We're selling Gaz. See you later. Touche. All, all them, all, all them records you've broken up. Yeah. I mean, they're in my in a distant memory, aren't they? They're history. So let's go to modern day players. Kane, Kane. Bit more versatile. Bit more all rounded. Lovely striker, lovely technique. But I'm going to put him on the bench. Got to. Great decision. <laughs> oh, Great decision. Alan Shearer, <laughs> the Jordan boys. You We're know, playing him, yes. You know class when you see class. Look at that. You absolute wanker. <laughs> <laughs> Are you all right there, guys? She's not speaking to you. <laughs> oh, I've never seen you play. I've never seen. We didn't see him, did we? 
I've still not seen the video footage. <laughs> just records, just numbers I see. That's all I see. Let me tell you, if, if you'd have seen me play, you'd be buying me all over. <laughs> No question at all. Um, Jack yeah. Smith. Hi, Gary. Spurs fan Jack here. Wondering who was the toughest person to score or defend against. Love the podcast. Listen while I do the paper round. Paper round's still a thing. Fantastic. Um, toughest to play against. Uh, I Probably I went from my time to... I'll go Des Walker and Paul McGrath. Paul uh, McGraw, when he was at Villa, I struggled man. against him. He was very yeah. good. Very you, good, Alan? Yeah. Tony Adams. Um, yeah, Tony Adams for me, it was definitely. Yap Stam was tough as yeah. well. I'll bet he was, yeah. Micah, toughest strikes to play against? Ooh, Thierry Henry, Drogba. Right. Matt Everett. It's often said that some players struggle to adapt to the Premier League and that it's the hardest league. In your professional opinion, and oh, that's weird. In your professional opinion, why is this? And if it's true, which players from other leagues would fit right in if they got a move? I think it's one of the most physical leagues uh, in the world, isn't it? And we still play at a high pace now, but I don't think. Football varies so much now, um, certainly across the big leagues in Europe. Um, you know, the S Spanish league, yes, they kind of play a more possession-based football, but German football is pretty energetic and dynamic. Um, so is English football too. So I, I think that's something we probably say a lot here. That's be but I think some players will struggle to adapt in any league they go to. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt this is the this is the most physical the Premier League. Um, it is the quickest. But you also got to remember, the football is a human, you know? It's like, if if it doesn't... You've got things behind the scene, you've got families that you've got to settle and everything else. And so it's it's, it's not as simple as, all right, I'm just going to turn up, I'm going to sign, and I'm going to, going to go out and play. There's, there's so many different factors to actually playing well. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> but if you're the best, if you look at someone like Kylian Mbappe... Yeah. If he came to the the, the the Premier League, he he would fit in. He does it in the French League, Champions League. I mean, so many players have come here and fit and, and fit perfectly yeah. well, don't they? Yeah. yeah, loads of them. Really good players. Uh, Kevin yeah. Johnson, the pod remains fabulous. Why? Well, thank you. Uh, two parts. Mm -hmm. Why don't all or nearly all offensively minded players learn to use their weaker foot? And why don't co coaches force players to learn? The advantages of being able to shoot and pass with either foot seem so huge and the cost um, so low that this mystifies me. Why isn't this like fitness a minimum requirement? Well, I think all players do work on the weaker foot, don't they? I certainly did. But some players, you know, it's like some people can use two hands quite well and you can practice as much as you like with the other hand but it might never be quite as good as as your natural hand same thing isn't it i, I just think who were the two or you'd say the top five ever players to, to play the game you won't you won't remember uh a guy who i'm going to mention russell osman Mike. Uh, gary will I know, know him Russ, yeah, great. He, he was he was he was an unbelievable you couldn't tell left foot or right foot um when i was at southampton as a youngster he used to spray it around um, with either foot. He was he was one of the best I've seen. He was incredible. Yeah. Santi Corzola yeah. was a bit like that, wasn't he? There's a lot of players actually um, perfectly two footed, but yeah, I think I think you do work at it, don't you? I remember you have to. I remember you do you do work at it, but I mean the the question I ask, you've got Messi who was so one footed, and Maradona yeah. who was so one footed. Yeah, the best players ever. So I I, I don't think it's too much of a of a problem, is it? It's just what you're used to, what you practice on every single day, don't and you? Andy Bremer, the German fullback, took took a penalty in the World Cup semi final with one foot, and then in the final with the other foot, which is uh, <laughs> which is quite something. Yeah, I wouldn't have fancied doing that with my left foot with a penalty. Uh, that 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 is a that is a two footed person, right? Let's have um, one more question. David Chapelau or Chapelo. I saw Mourinho and R9, that's um, 
Brazilian Ronaldo, for those that don't know, congratulating Joshua on his recent win. Anthony Joshua, I presume. The Americans I saw... Uh, who are boxing fans, had no idea who they were. Have you ever been in a situation where you were completely blanked and nobody knew who you were? Do you actually like that at times? Thank you from Taiwan. <laughs> Ooh, a listener in Taiwan. Um, oh I quite, it's quite nice when nobody knows you, isn't it? It's, I, I remember when you got blanked not so long ago. Can you remember? Ruby? No, Gaz. Oh, yeah. I know what you're going to say here. <laughs> yeah. Would this be low to Mateus? Yes, it yeah. was. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's funny. We were coming out in Qatar, weren't we? After one yeah. of the games. We may have mentioned this at some point, but we were coming out and um, low to Mateus was just in front. So I thought, oh, I've you know, obviously played against him in the, the World Cup semi final, met him a few times, tapped him on the shoulder, and. Um, He's going, and he brushed me off. What are you doing? Don't touch me. I went, oh, no, I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's me, Gary. He went, and he's just completely, he got the complete huff. And I went, well, we, we played against each other way back. And oh, God, it was, I was just desperate. Um, and then it's funny, I saw him um, a few months later at a thing in Spain. I did a museum, and he, he came to me, and he obviously was embarrassed, and he, he said, "Oh, I'd, you know, I didn't see that," and he was chatting away for a, for a while. So <laughs> it was a proper custard oh, pie. It was, well, wasn't it? it? It really, really <laughs> was. Uh, I had I had <sighs> got properly blanked by um, Bob Geldof once. Did you? Yeah, it was the GQ Awards. I don't know, six, seven years ago, and he came up, and I, I, I went to say hello like that, and I put my arm out to shake his hand. And he just looked like straight through me and then saw someone he did recognise just behind me <laughs> and left me hanging. <laughs> left me hanging. <laughs> oh, it's cheers, Bob. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> uh, have you had any? You... I can't, I, not that I can remember. I, no, I can't I, remember that. I had one with uh, Lewis Hamilton. So we was doing something with Sky and uh, Mercedes. And basically what we planned, it was around COVID time that I could go follow his journey, who's someone who knows nothing about F1, just to see behind the scenes. But then we do the road trips with Lee Garone, don't we? And the team we're doing our sort of um, our show with is, is Red Bull. And obviously they're massive rivals. So like, I know him, he knows me, you know, he said hello. We, we, literally I was following him around. So we're in, uh, where did we go? We're in Asia somewhere. We're in Asia. Where, where was Asia? Was it Singapore? I think it was in Singapore. So literally he's coming down. You know the walk in F1 and all that and everyone's coming down. They've got all the paps taking photos and whatnot. And I'm, I'm stood there in all my Red Bull gear and he's looked at me and I've looked at him and I've got like to say, uh, and he just blanked me. <laughs> I've never felt so little in all my life. <laughs> Quite right as well, wearing Red Bull. Well, I mean, I was doing it for the show. I wasn't doing it for anything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the end, end of a beautiful friendship, wasn't it then, Mike? What a shame. It was, yes. Not spoke to him since. You better get a Ferrari suit on for next season. Oh, yes. I'm a Ferrari man now. <laughs> Aren't we all? Um, on that note, um, that's it for our question and answer episode. Um, we'll see you later in the week. Uh, but goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye from me.